We are number 10. This is going to be our concluding message. I will preach again next Sunday before I take a couple of weeks break. Pastor Jeremy is preparing. I'm going to bring you a little mini-series. I'm excited. I will be here for at least one of those, probably be out of town, one of them. But we are concluding our habit series this morning, and this one is called Sharpen the Axe. Look at your neighbor and say, sharpen your axe. All right, now we're talking about a woodcutter's tool and the importance of keeping our axe sharp. If you would look with me to Ecclesiastes, if you have a Bible this morning, that's great. If you don't, we have it on the screen. Or if you have a smartphone, version has all of the notes that I'm going to be preaching from. They're already there. And you can capture that while we're actually looking at this this morning. version. look for the Victory Church event on version, And uh, you'll be able... By the way, how many of you have gotten the new Victory Church app? Okay, if you just open that up, then you can connect to the Bible right there. And the, the notes are right there. So you'll be able to find everything. This is the reason we quit printing them, because we have so many different avenues for people to be able to uh, grab hold of them in terms of what we're saying. Ecclesiastes... The book of wisdom following the, the one that everybody knows about, Proverbs, 31 chapters. Interesting that there are 31 days in most months. And uh, if, you're, if you don't have a Bible reading plan, let me tell you a great way to begin your day. Just take one chapter a day and read the proverb for the day. Today is the 17th, so read the 17th chapter of the book of Proverbs. There are a lot of little pithy sayings in it that, uh, you know, sometimes you might have to stop and kind of think about it. Uh, but there's some great wisdom that you can glean from looking at the book of Proverbs before you begin your day because you're going to be facing decisions, critical things that are important for you to be able to stay in line with what the revealed word of God is. That's from his word. Somebody say amen. Ecclesiastes comes right after that, written primarily by Solomon, referred to himself as the preacher in the book. And so the book of Ecclesiastes in, verse, in chapter 10, verse 10, reading from the Amplified Bible, says, If the axe is dull and he does not sharpen its edge, then he must exert more strength. Everybody say more strength. But wisdom, to sharpen the axe, helps him succeed with less effort. How many of you know it's important that we learn how to work smarter and not necessarily work harder? Now, we don't need to be afraid to work. I've never in my life been afraid to work. I'll, I'll work up a sweat. I'll, I'll put in you know, 8 or 10 or 12 hours. Um, I've got some stories I'm going to tell you about that a little bit later in the message. But before I do, ESV, the English Standard Version, considered by uh, just about most of the Greek scholars, will tell you this one is the clearest and the most accurate in terms of translations. It says it this way, if the iron is blunt, everybody say blunt. So it's dull, it's blunt, okay. If the iron is blunt and one does not sharpen the edge, he must use more strength, but wisdom helps one to succeed. I love the message. This is the one I saved for last. Remember, the duller the axe, the harder the work. Use your head. The more brains, the less muscle. We all need some of that sometimes, right? Um, our one thing that we bring in our messages here, when I preach in the message, I will give you one thing that we'll say a new number of times throughout the sermon, through the message, so that this sort of gets ingrained in your thinking, and then during the week you can remember, this is it. Say it with me. Take care of you and what you do will be more effective. Now, I didn't hear you, so help me. Come on. Take care of you, and what you do will be more effective. That's at about 60%. Come on, give me 100. Hey, everybody. Take care of you, and what you do will be more effective. Beautiful. What we're talking about this morning is called the law of renewal. Every one of these habits that we've discussed have had a law, or a principle, better said, from the Word of God that shows us that if we'll put them into play, put them in the right place that they can make huge differences in our lives. Let's pray this morning. Gracious God, thank you for this time together in your word. Lord, I just ask you today to let my thoughts be your thoughts. Give me, O oh God, instruction. Give me direction. Lord, today let the word of the Lord be in my heart. And I pray right now, even as the psalmist did let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. I acknowledge before you and this people that I need you. I'm desperate from you. I know that apart from you that I'm nothing. But Lord, I also know that I'm not apart from you, that Christ is in me, the hope of glory. 
that, that the one who strengthens me gives me the ability to accomplish all things that you've called me to do. And I ask today for that teacher, for that anointing, for that, for that chain breaker, for, for that barrier destroyer, that spirit of God, the spirit of truth, the spirit of power and might and wisdom, that it would be in the hearts of your people today that you would be their eyes to see and their ears to hear that the gospel of God, the good news that Jesus Christ is Lord right now, that that would penetrate, Lord, the, the fog that has rolled into our thinking, the confusion, the struggle that, that some of us in this room are facing and wrestling through. I pray for that today. I ask you specifically for clarity and for brevity. Let the words of the Lord be spoken today in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. The law of renewal. We are dealing with a number of habits that we've learned through this series. This one is the capstone. This one finishes them off and it guarantees that the cooperation of all of the other habits are continuously working and effective. That the law of renewal is speaking particularly about ongoing personal renewal. There is a parable that I'd like to tell you this morning, and in this will be our review this morning for the previous nine messages. We can't go back and preach them. Obviously, don't have the time. Uh, they're all available to you through our app or on our website or through iTunes or any. We have about four or five different platforms, and it's, every one of them is free. So we're not asking you to subscribe and pay a fee. We're not selling them per sermon or anything like that so that I can get a boat in a cabin uh, in North Carolina. We don't, we don't do any of that kind of stuff. It's all free. Everybody say it's free, 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 free. Some of you have seen that commercial. <laughs> I get aggravated every time I see it. It's free. <laughs> a woodcutter was raised in a little small village in an impoverished area, secluded and isolated from most of the known world. And somehow he managed to walk through a door of opportunity that was presented to him and he landed in Marion, Arkansas. And he became part of Victory Church momentarily. Just for a few moments, he landed here the first Sunday that we opened this series on habits. And something was sparked in his heart. A fire was kindled. He was able to have a paradigm shift and to see things from a new perspective. The Bible calls that repentance. That's a very churchy sounding word. Business People use that same concept, but they just talk about a paradigm shift. We can liken it to putting on a new pair of glasses and then seeing things with a fresh perspective. So he, he was able to grasp that the first Sunday that he was here, and he came back the next Sunday very inspired and kind of a fire burning in his bosom. And he heard about the importance of being proactive, and at the end of that service, he made a commitment that he would become responsible. That's just... We remember that between the stimulus and my reaction to it, there's a period of time. It can be a second. It can be a month. But there's a time where we have the choice on how we're going to respond to what happens to us. It was Chuck Swindoll who said, 90% of how our life is lived is through our attitude. And it's not what happens, but it's our response to what happens. And our attitude certainly determines that. And so he, he came away with a fresh perspective and he decided he was going to be responsible. He was able to make his choices on how he was going to respond. And he caught a vision and something began to burn even more brightly in his heart. He began to think about his home village and how this message and the gospel needed to penetrate the poverty and the, the, the narrow thinking and the, the, the ignorance and the racism that existed in his little small community. And so he began to pray, and he'd found a place to live here in Marion, and he, he, he was just meditating this vision that was growing on the inside of him to go back to his village and to be able to, to cut through the forest so that a highway could be able to come through and bring blessing into that small community. And he heard the message the next Sunday about beginning with the end in mind. And so he started thinking about the bigness of the vision and what it was going to take to accomplish that and leaning into trust in God and exercising his faith. 
And he began to plan and strategize and he was praying and he, he thought about what he wanted to accomplish in the end and then began to set things in line for that to happen. He came the next Sunday and he realized how important it was that if he was going to accomplish that vision that he was going to put first things first. Chris Wilson spoke that morning, did a great job and he told us that priorities are what we do, everything else is just talk. And we learned that we need to prioritize not prioritize our schedules, but we need to schedule our priorities. So we have to put first things first. And so he, he, he decided he would be responsible and he, 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 he started dealing with beginning with the end in mind and getting his vision. And then he said, you know what, I'm going to put things in right perspective and right priority. And he came the next Sunday and he learned about the importance of, uh, of, of thinking in win-win. And, and we saw from the word that that concept of uh, typically the way we're raised as children in a highly competitive kind of environment is there's a winner and there's a whole bunch of losers. But biblically, we want to live out of two principles. Jesus talked about the golden rule, do unto others as you wish they would treat you or as you would have them do unto you, the original translation or the, the King James says. So basically, how you want people to treat you, begin to live out of that. Live, do to them what you want them to do to and for you. And the other principle that Jesus taught in this thinking win-win was basically what we call the great commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. The two are like the two bars of the cross. An upward bar reaching up to love God with everything that is in me and an outward bar reaching out to love my brothers and sisters as I do myself. We talked about the order that that comes in, loving God, loving myself, and then loving others. Because if I don't learn how to love what God has made me to be and what He is transforming me into to be, then my neighbor doesn't have a chance. Somebody say amen if you understand that. So he came back the next Sunday and he realized that this thing was growing on the inside of him and the fire was blazing and he, at this point he decided to forsake the idea of working to save his money to get a boat but he wanted to get the tools he needed so he could go back to his village. He wanted to cut through the forest so a highway of blessing could come into his small isolated community. And he came that Sunday and he learned that it was important that we seek to understand before we seek to be understood. We learned about listening, about paying attention not just pretending like we're hearing or selective hearing the way most of our wives accuse us of living as husbands. But that fifth level of hearing, not just attentive listening, but the fifth one of, called empathic listening, where we literally pay enough attention that we get into the shoes of the individual. We start to feel the struggle that they're feeling. This is what Jesus did for us in the Bible that says that we have a high priest who is touched by the feelings of our infirmities, what we feel he's already felt, what we are tempted with, he's already won the victory over the temptation. What we struggle with, he's already run the race and won the race. Somebody say amen. Came back last week and heard me preach synergize, to work together. The whole is greater than the sum of his parts. And he got so fired up, he didn't wait to make it to this Sunday before he went out and he made his way back to his home village. He took with him a brand new axe and he started hacking down all of those trees in that dense forest and he was making headway but every day the, something began to happen. Every tree that he cut down was harder to cut down than the one before and he noticed that he was working harder and he was just straining, just taking much longer just to get one tree down where he was a few days before he was literally 10 or 12 trees in that same amount of time and the tragedy is is that Friday of this week, they found the woodcutter dead. He had died because he had failed to do an important thing. He never sharpened his axe. And so this morning, in the next few moments, out of that little parable, I want to teach to you from the Word of God the importance of keeping your axe sharp. Look at your neighbor and say, keep your axe sharp. First habit that we need to develop is to regularly sharpen our axe, and we're talking about ongoing personal renewal. If, if the habits that we have employed, if the plan we have in place, the vision that we want to accomplish, the goals we have set out before us, you know what? We may finish life, but we'll finish it too soon. We will die early because we didn't take care of the acts. With this comes the revelation of an important understanding. I don't know if you realize this, 
but you are God's axe. You are the axe in the hands of God because God accomplishes His will through believers. God can do anything He wants to at any place and any time, but He chooses to do it through the human agency, through believers who've put their trust in Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. There's the revelation that we, not just me, but we, everybody say we, because we is far bigger than me and we can accomplish what me, what me can't do. We are the acts, A-X-E, the acts of God. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says that I am a spirit, I have a soul, and I live in a body. I'm made in the image of God. God is spirit. The Bible tells us that in John 4.24. And they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. I'm made in His image, so God is spirit, I am spirit. God has a mind, He thinks. God has a will. He desires something for you and for the universe and for creation and for His children and for people who don't yet know Him. He wants. God has emotion. Psalm 2 says, He that sits in the heavens laughs at the stupidity of men trying to take over in the place of a God who is sovereign, who is controlling, who is declaring, who is raising up kings and setting them down. Jesus said, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how oft I would have come to you and gathered you together as a hen would brood over her chicks. And Jesus wept. Shortest verse in the Bible is when Jesus stood before the tomb of Lazarus, his good friend, and the two sisters that were, that were hurt and grieving and a little bit angry that Jesus knew that Lazarus was sick and didn't come heal him when they sent word. He's sitting there before Lazarus knowing that he's about to be raised from the dead, but yet in that moment, Jesus chose to feel. The Bible says Jesus wept. The God who omnipotently knows, who omnisciently knows everything, who knew that Lazarus was about to get up and the stone would move and the dead man would come out of the grave. Yet he chose to weep, to, to be able to relate to the grief of the two sisters that were friends to him. Don't tell me Jesus doesn't care about what you're going through. He feels what you feel. And so... God is a spirit, he has a soul, and he lives in a body. And the body of God is this people. This is called the body of Christ. Are you following me so far? I am a spirit, I have a soul. My soul is my mind, my will, and my emotions. My mind is what I think, my will is what I want, my emotions are what I feel. Now, when I'm able to give that to God and say, Lord, not what I want, not what I think, but what I feel, but Lord, I will lose my soul life in order to gain your eternal life. I'll lay this down because I know you know better than I do because my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. Somebody say amen. The woodcutter parable teaches us something very important because we are too busy to sharpen our own axe. The woodcutter destroyed himself. So many times we are so determined to finish, to, 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 to conclude the project, to finish the deadline, to meet the goals to make the numbers come in right at the end of the month, to please our wife, to please our husband, to please our children. I mean, you just make the list is just about uh, endless, ad infinitum. And there's so many things that we are pressed to do that we neglect our ongoing personal renewal. And we end up destroying the very thing that God has given us to accomplish the task. Because I want you to know it's not just, just that you're a spirit and you have a soul, but you live in a body and this is your earth suit. This is what gives you the ability to have expression in this dimension, in this earth. Because if you don't have one of these, you're just a disembodied spirit and folk can't hear you. You can't, you can't express yourself. You have to have one of these. Just like when you go to the moon, you have a moon suit on that is pressurized, that takes care of you in that environment. This is your earth suit. So we've got to take care of the earth suit. Somebody say amen. You remember the little children's fable was the goose that laid the golden egg. Well, your skill, your talent, your life, your breath, your desires, all of these things combined what God has called you to accomplish as an individual, maybe as a business person, a practice, a teaching students in school, uh, developing a community outreach, any number of things that you have on your heart to accomplish to be able to raise some children that are champions for the kingdom of God. Nobody wants to raise idiots. Well, if you don't raise any, it means you're going to be determined to raise 
be involved and not just telling them what to do, but be an example for how they should live. Somebody say, don't shout me down. You remember the goose and the golden eggs? Well, the whole point is, is that you better take care of the goose. It's not just guarding the eggs, but it's taking care of the goose. And in, in the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Dr. Covey talks about the PC slash P relationship, the product capability, product relationship. And, and it's not just about the end product of getting the golden eggs out of your business, out of your relationship, out of your marriage, out of your kids, out of your community, it, but it's the fact that you guard and take care of and you have maintenance for the goose. You minister to the goose. Look at your neighbor and say, you better take care of that goose. It is through Christians that Christ's work is done. There's maintenance for you in your life. We need to pay attention to the physical. You better not neglect the physical acts. You need to rest. You need to have the right kinds of food. You need to exercise. One person in the church called me last night and said, we have two extra tickets to the Amos Lee concert at the Orpheum. Do you want to go? And I had foolishly taken the shingles vaccine and the flu shot Friday. Same day, shouldn't have done two. And I'm a hyper, whatever, I, any kind of medication, I, there's a hyper reaction to, with me. And I was jittery all day, didn't feel good, I was achy. And just, I'm, I'm like, about one o'clock laying on the, the couch up in the man cave at my house, I'm just praying, Lord, if I messed up in doing this, please throw your grace over me. Help me out here, Father, because I feel like, I feel like, I won't tell you what I said I felt like, because I don't need to say it in church, but I felt like it. Some of you are looking at me through a legalistic tone of voice. Don't do it. You know you've at least thought it if you hadn't even said it. And I'm going, Lord, help me. i got to preach tomorrow, and I feel like, mm, the bottom end of the barrel. <laughs> And I said, you know what, I really love, because I love Amos Lee, I'd really love to go, but I better get some rest. How many of you know sometimes you, you need to back up and know when you better get some rest? Now, when I was 28, I could do whatever I wanted to as long as I wanted to, and it didn't matter, but I'm 58 now. And it's not just that I'm wiser, but my body is in a different position. <laughs> Growing old is not for sissies. There's a social and an emotional aspect to your life. Relationships are the most wonderful, at the same time, the most difficult part of your life. Relationships make you or break you. They're, they're awesome in that they fulfill and they strengthen, but they frustrate the living out of you. Man is a social creature, but our hurry lifestyles are killing our relationships. Dr. David Baldwin calls it the hurry sickness. Some of you don't think you have it, but go home today and see when you put your food in the microwave and it's set for 90 seconds and you're standing there going, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. You have just diagnosed yourself with hurry up itis. Our current generation is without parents. We're without real friends. We have shallow marriage relationships. Am I telling the truth right now? I'm in the, right, I'm in the wrong church. Our spiritual lives need to have the axe sharpened. We, we, we don't pray because we're on the run. We run too fast for God. No Bible reading. You know, I don't expect anybody in here to, to, you know, to log in hours every day, but my goodness, get one verse and just meditate that verse or, or, or maybe make the decision to put it on a card and memorize that verse this week. It's amazing how God can feed you from one little bitty tiny verse of Scripture. Church... These are just a few things that we should be doing to sharpen the axe in our spirits. I get ready, I'm going to impress you, okay? Are you, are you listening? Teilhard de Chardin, a French philosopher. That's, that's powerful, isn't it? Chardin said, listen now, I'm just joking to keep you awake, come on. We are not human beings having a spiritual experience but we are spiritual beings having a human experience. Do you hear that? Now, I don't know what church old Telly went to, Teilhard de Chardin, but I agree with that 110%. You're not a human being having a spiritual experience, but you're a spiritual being having a human experience. Because what's in here goes on after the, the flesh, the body, the earth suit dies. Somebody say amen. 
the root of all physical, natural things are spiritual things. To fail to sharpen the axe spiritually costs us in all of our other areas. Let's don't exclude the mental. We need a mind that's always growing, a mind that's on the stretch. Come on, help me. If you're old enough to remember the commercial, a mind is a terrible thing to waste. You saw that. You heard that. And how important that is. It's, it's, it's a shame that, that some folks who have the blessing and the privilege to go to college never read another book after they're finished. They got all the reading and they want to do in between 18 and 22. You know, if you're not a reader, that's fine. Plug in an audio book or listen to a podcast or, or get you some inspiration or some information through some other kind of means. We, we are the most blessed technologically we have ever been before, so we are without excuse when it comes to sharpening our mental faculties. A mind is a terrible thing to waste. The mental needs not only just pounding in information, but we need to relax and we need some meditation and even occasionally we need some entertainment. Come on, somebody. Are you too religious to say amen to that? Uh, Abby went nearly three years in New York without a television and I kept saying, baby, let me buy you one for Christmas. No, I don't want one. I, I know you're just really, you're all a little hipster and everything and, and you're writing these amazing songs and you've got the weight of planning this new album that's coming out and you're meeting the, all these cool people and you're singing with them. I'm telling you, baby, you need some time to decompress and relax. And I finally talked her into going to get into TV, and she watched it two weeks straight. <laughs> and then she said, okay, now I can back up, because I had none. I've been on like a starvation of television and entertainment. But now I realize that, you know, at least a couple of times a week, I need to sit down and just have a couple of hours of shut the brain down and just mindlessly laugh and be entertained and and let my mind have a break from the pressure that it's under. How many of you know what I'm talking about? So, you know, it may be fishing. It may be kayaking or canoeing. It may be skiing. It may be going to the lake. It, it may be going on a hike or riding your bicycle. Or it may be reading a book. Or it may be things that you don't get to do normally. Or an afternoon on the golf course or swimming or whatever you like to do. That you're able to involve something else where you have a distraction from the pressure of your job and the pressure of all the stuff that you have to do all the time. You need to sharpen your mental faculties. Come on, somebody, say amen. If you take care of you, what you do will be more effective. Major, and second point, number two, there's some toxic faith issues that we need to deal with because we are marinated every day in churchianity. This is the Bible Belt South, and there's all kinds of legalism that is, exists all around us by a majority of the population that don't even go to church, but they've had church experience. A whole host of Crittenden County, literally less than 20% of Crittenden County goes to church, but a whole bunch of them have been in church and gotten hurt, and they're burnt stones that have been kicked out of the wall of a congregation somewhere. And so they have all of these, this mixture, this collective consciousness of what they think church is about and what church is like and who God is and and, and from that, they develop all of these concepts that are really not based in the Bible or the Word of God. Are you hearing me this morning? And we deal with a neurotic guilt. A guilt, and if, you, if, if you've come from a good Roman Catholic background, you, you, were learned, you learned guilt from day one. And you basically had the idea that you had to do this or that or the other to be able to get a gold star and please God. And let me just say this to you. Protestants, you don't, you're not any better because if you went to a good Baptist church, you learned guilt too. And let me tell you, if you went to a Pentecostal church the way I did when I was a little kid growing up, I really got some guilt in there. And, and, and it becomes a completely abused, misused, misunderstood thing. If I've done something wrong, I should feel guilt. But when I come before God and I've been forgiven, then I should be released from that. And too many times we've got a bunch of religious, legalistic expectations that have been put on us. There was a book a few years ago that says, the title of it was, When I Relax, I Feel Guilty. Now, don't snicker because some of you know what I'm talking about. You can't quit. You're always on the move. There's something else you've got to accomplish. Your to-do list is always growing. Something else needs to be done. And you can't sit down because when you relax, you feel guilty. You feel like you're not accomplishing anything. Don't forget the importance of actively resting in order to be able to sharpen your axe. Somebody say amen. A performance mentality drives us to wear ourselves out without pausing to sharpen the axe. In our culture, in our pace of life, 
we're cutting through the jungle where we're trying to just get through all of this dense forest so that we can get a highway for the blessings of God to come into our lives and, and deal with the isolation and the narrow thinking and, and the stuff that we've sort of been bound in our own box and our set of limitations and we're trying to plow through it and bless our children and raise some good kids and have a marriage that lasts. We try to have a business that's successful. And all this stuff that we have on us and the pace of life that we're living with, our hurry-up-itis, Literally, these are the things that can destroy us because the only solution is that we commit to ongoing personal renewal. Everybody say renewal. Now, this is something that Jesus knew the importance of. He practiced it himself. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. One out of every seven days, God set aside for the purpose of rest. Don't do anything on this day. Now, the Sabbath was God's idea, but men and religion have taken that idea and they've legalized it. And this is what Jesus wrestled with. Do you realize that when you read the Gospels, it was never sinners that gave Jesus trouble? It was all of those haughty church folk, temple folk, Pharisees. There was never a sinner who knew that he was living a life in sin. There was never a sinner who recognized that he was doing wrong, who ever gave Jesus trouble. It was always religious folk that were always stirring up as much trouble as they possibly could because they were threatened that Jesus was going to come and upset the apple cart because of the money, the, the economic situation they had in control over the people. You always, it's always about the money, folk. Somebody say Amen. Jesus is called the Lord of the Sabbath. And, and, and I want to say this, rest isn't always an activity. Sometimes it's an alternative. Sometimes it's a distraction. Uh, it's something different that brings renewal. Pharisees come to Jesus and they're just totally got their panties in a wad over the fact that the disciples are walking through the cornfields, plucking the ears of corn, and they're, they're taking bites out of the ears of corn because they're hungry. And it's the Sabbath day. And the Pharisees are accusing them and they're upset with them. And Jesus said, guys, you, you, you need to figure this out. The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. There's not a one of you who don't take the rope down and, and loose your donkey and lead him out to some water. That's work. There's not a one of you who has an ox in the ditch who wouldn't go out with the aid of some friends and get that ox out of the ditch. He says, do you not remember in the Old Testament... He didn't say Old Testament, but it was where he was referring to. He said, do you not remember when David went into the tabernacle and he ate the showbread which was specifically reserved for the priest and God didn't get angry with him. He didn't get judged. There was nobody pointing the finger and accusing him. Guys, the Sabbath is made for man, not man for the Sabbath. The Sabbath day for me is not Sunday. This is my work day. I don't know what you know, think about this, but I'm standing up here working, preaching this thing twice. And I'm, I, there's adrenaline and there's energy. And, it, it, you know, at 9 o'clock service, I just think I have to come in here nearly with a lightning bolt to raise the dead. Because <laughs> folks still hadn't got used to the time change and they're just kind of... <laughs> and so after I do this twice, when I go home in the afternoon, I have to lay down and take a nap. Because I've had the adrenaline surge literally through two services. They hooked up, did a study on, on the, the, the energy that is exerted and the, the stress level on a pastor when he preaches one sermon in just a regular nominal church of about preaching a message of about 20, 25 minutes. Now, you know, we, we, we stretch it and go a little longer around here. Do you know that they determined that the amount of stress on an average pastor in one Sunday morning service in an hour is typical of what a person spends in an eight-hour workday? Well, by the time I do that twice, guys, i got to go home and lay down. Because it takes some energy to get up here and keep some of y'all awake. <laughs> I don't know what you did last night or how long you stayed out, but it ain't my fault. <laughs> Look at your neighbor and say, he's preaching real good now. Mark 2.27, the Pharisees are angry. Jesus basically said, you guys don't even get it. The, law, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. The primary need among Christians is to learn to practice the skill of personal renewal. Sunday's a work day for me, so Monday, most pastors take Monday off because it's a day where they can disconnect and they can be able to have some time to just relax and do something different. And so typically that's the time when I kind of unwind and do stuff that's not work-related. 
uh, I still get up and have my devotional in the morning and read through some chapters and pray, but everything I do on Monday is all about kind of taking care of me, some self-care. Somebody say amen. The time that we devote today to our marriage, to our children, to our physical body, to our spirit, to our minds is never wasted time. It sharpens our acts for tomorrow. Look at your neighbor and say, sharpen your acts. Dr. Archibald Hart states that we need to become intentional about recognizing that we are a human machine and we need maintenance. We run too fast for God too often. We abuse the machine. We destroy the tool that God has given us for doing the work. And we need to learn to say no. As much as I wanted to get up off the couch and go to the Amos Lee concert at the Orpheum last night, and I appreciate the brother who offered me two tickets, I just said, man, i got to turn them down. I need to stay right where I am and rest because I want to preach tomorrow and I want to be able to faithfully do what the Lord has called me to do. So I was making that decision not only for me but for you last night. Somebody say amen. How many marriages are in trouble because of the failure to practice this habit? Do you want the secret to staying in love? Anybody in the room want the secret to staying in love? All right, $29.99, write that check for me right now, and I'll meet with you. At, no, I'm just teasing. Here's the free secret for staying in love. Communicate. Talk. Listen. Especially about your feelings. The guy said, okay, I was fine with you till you said feelings. I don't want, I'm not interested in that. She's got enough for both of us. Come on, guys, you know what I'm talking about. Ladies, don't get mad at me because I said that. It's a fact. Men and women are wired differently. As much as the world wants to make us identical and the same, we are not the same. We are diverse. And that's for a reason. Too many people are addicted and living out of controlled lives that they're trying to medicate pain that they were never willing or never have been willing to face. Putting a pill in the place of just dealing with a problem, fixing it. The bottom line, what's the bottom line to this message today? It, folks, it's time to sharpen your axe. Look at your neighbor and say, it's time to sharpen your axe. Take care of you, and what you do will be more effective. Take care of you, and what you do will be more effective. I'm finished with my last point this morning, the example of Jesus. How did Jesus demonstrate these principles to us and for us? He had an unlimited source in that he only did and said what he saw and heard the Father say. He was not looking for the approval of men, but the approval of the Heavenly Father. Jesus practiced this very same idea of personal renewal in Luke 5, 15 and 16. He says, but despite Jesus' instructions, the report of his power spread even faster and vast crowds came to hear him preach and to be healed of their diseases. He had instructed the group of folks that just got healed, keep it quiet, go see the priest. And they did the opposite of what he said. The news was noised abroad, as the old King James says, and the folks started showing up in droves. Verse 16 says, but Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness for prayer. Another translation says he went to a solitary place. How many of you know what you want when you go to a solitary place? Nobody else there with you. Sometimes I am probably on the extroverted side. I love people. I enjoy being with people. But I also know, just like there's a warning light on my Explorer, when it tells me I've got 50 miles until the tank is empty, I can see it flashing when Sister Bottle Stopper is telling me about her ingrown toenail. And I've just, I've had a week and maybe I've missed my devotional day or two. Pastor, I can't believe you'd even say that. How many of you know I'm just as real as you are? You oversleep one morning, you've got an appointment that you're already 10 minutes late for and you get up and throw everything on and you try to head out. There's no devotion that day. And so you get under the worry and the care the frustration, you know, just, just trying to get this building built. I was concerned about myself for that year, and I, I, I made a mistake of, of going and, and having a, a, the shingles vaccine and the flu shot taken last Friday. I didn't even want the flu shot. I just wanted the shingles, and she talked me into the flu. She wanted to give me the tetanus and the pertussis too, and I said, hey, hold on now. <laughs> hold on now. What, are you going to hit every quadrant on my body? Because the shingles is over here and the flu is over here. One of the brothers came up and, good morning. I said, you hit me again and I'll knock your head off. That's sore right there. <laughs> I mean, how many of you know what I'm talking about? 
Mark 6.32 says, so they left by boat for a quiet place where they could be alone. As much as I love people, I have to have some cave time. You know what the cave time is? The cave time is when I renew, when I recharge the batteries, when I hit reboot on my spiritual and mental computer, control, alt, delete, whatever. You know, just, I, just, I hit a refresh and I, I, I fill up my own tank. I drive through and I get the tank topped off and then I'm ready to get back in my vehicle and get out here and cut some more wood down so the highway of God's blessing can come into my life and my family and this church and our community and the Delta. Come on, somebody say amen. Your journey, your journey, what you have to recognize is that personal change is a lifetime undertaking and it's primarily rooted in character and not your personality. You can't grin your way through this. You can't smile your way. If you do, there will be a time where there's nothing left in your tank and there's no strength to be able to push the two ends of your mouth up into a smile. You know what? Jesus transforms us differently from the world from the inside out. Everybody said the inside out. We change from the inside out. The Lord works from the inside out. The world works from the outside in. The world works to take people out of the slums. Christ takes the slums out of people. And then they take themselves out of the slums. Come on, put your hands together and give the Lord praise. The world attempts to mold men by changing their environments. The nurture argument. Christ changes men who then change their environment. The world wants to change the culture. Christ can only, cha only can change human behavior and human nature, which can then change the culture. I'm finished this morning. Come on, Sid, where are you? Our one thing, take care of you and what you do will be more effective. Say it again with me. Take care of you and what you do will be more effective. Listen, listen to me as I, I bring this to the critical, this is the bottom line of this right here. As, as many great habits as you try to build, as, as much as you do to put yourself in a better position to be able to relate with people and improve relationships, there is no success, there is no real accomplishment in your life for the kingdom of God, in your marriage, with your children, in your business, your career until you get centered and that center has to be the one who was who gave himself to live in that center and his name is Jesus we have to be Christ centered Jesus centered in our lives and the only way we can do that is to come to a place where we say father I'm not going to try to keep my position as king of the hill any longer but I'm going to relinquish it I'm going to resign myself Jesus sit on the throne of my heart be Lord of my life. And before you go out the door this morning, the most critical decision you will make, the biggest question that you will be asked is have you come to the place in your spiritual life where you know for certain that Jesus Christ is the center, the Lord of your life? If you were to die right now, would you go to heaven and be in His presence? I can't answer that for you. You may think you're a good person. But if you've never leaned into the Lord and put your trust in Him, your goodness won't get you anywhere because our goodness, our righteousness, the Bible says, are as menstruous cloths, as filthy rags. So in all of our effort and all of our religiousness and all of our performance mentality, God says, I'm not after all of your offerings. I'm weary of all the bulls and goats, all the religious performance activity that people do. I just want your heart so this morning, have you had that realization where you've said, Lord, I give you my heart. Come into the center of who I am and change me from the inside out. Salvation is in no other. There's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. Salvation is not just a home in glory. It's not just escaping the wrath of God in a true, real hell. But salvation is it's a whole new kind of life that comes to us while we're still living on this side. Eternal life is not a long time. It's no time at all. And God wants to put that, it's not quantity of life, it's quality of life. Eternal life is quality of life. God wants to put that into your soul right now, into your heart right now. 
And if you've never crossed that line of faith, would you bow your heads with me, please?